Yes, hello, it is me. I am still here tonight. It is so good to see you all. Uh, that was a, I do announcements sometimes, so that was the joke. Yes, <laughs> I realize I don't want to make anyone feel bad if it's their first time, because we're glad you guys are here. I'm going to be talking about um, the Old Testament. It's what we've been going through. I'm really excited about it. But before I jump into that, just because I just want to seek validation for myself, and I have the mic so I can talk, uh, I really wanted to ask you guys a question that I have... Uh, I guess it's an opinion maybe that I really like, but maybe a lot of others don't. So I want to see a show of hands, actually. Um, if you prefer online classes, I actually really like those. Uh, my last semester when it started going online, I really enjoyed those. But I find a lot of people give me weird looks when I say that. So I wanted to come and bring it to any of you. Do any of you guys like online as opposed to in-person class? Okay, good. Honestly, there's more than two hands, so that makes me happy. <laughs> yes. But I don't know if you guys have felt that way. Like you've had some sort of, whether it's even like a silly opinion, but it's on something like that, and you're with maybe a group of like two other friends, and you're just walking along, and you say, yeah, online class, it was so easy today, and they just like give you the weirdest look, and then you realize, oh shoot, I'm outnumbered. I wish I could take that back. Like, you guys ever experienced that? I know I do quite often with my opinions, and sometimes it's like a silly scenario like that, but sometimes it can be a little bit deeper. You know, if you are a Christian, and maybe you are hanging out with an old friend group, or maybe you're in class, and the professor is talking about how there's no way that a God could exist, and people left and right are kind of nodding, and you just kind of feel that sense of, ooh, should I stand up for what I believe? Should I kind of laugh along with them? Like, you just don't feel good. You feel outnumbered in that situation, and that's pretty tough, and I was thinking about that, and the story that I wanted to share with you guys was about the prophet Elijah in the Old Testament. And the story that we're going to be going over actually uh, is right on the nose of that. Uh, Elijah was just severely outnumbered, outgunned in this amazing circumstance, but God pulled through. And so I want to let you know that if you ever are in that circumstance, especially with your faith, that you are in good company. So we're going to be looking at 1 Kings 18 tonight, just kind of going through just a good old-fashioned Bible study. But before we jump into that, I'd love to pray. So let's pray together. God, we just thank you for this night that we are able to meet here together on campus. And God, that you are just so good, that you love each one of us, and you gave your son to die on the cross for our sins, that we may know you and have a relationship with you. And we just thank you for that. And God, I also ask that just during the, my talk tonight, God, that you would just use me to speak truth, God, that whatever um, I say, as long as I'm speaking just from your word, God, that there is truth there, and that um, everyone will just be able to come away with an application and really know you better, God, regardless of how many times we may have heard the story of Elijah or if it's our first time. God, I pray that we would all just be able to learn something new today. We just thank you again for your goodness. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. So before I jump into the story, I want to give you guys a little bit of backstory so we can kind of see what's happening in the Old Testament. Uh, like I mentioned, 1 Kings 18. So during this time, there were a lot of kings in uh, Israel, which is God's uh, chosen people, the nation of Israel. And so if you guys have heard of King David, uh, he lived for a while. Cool dude. He had a son, King Solomon. Uh, he was the king for a while. Then there's a lot of other kings. Most of them weren't too great. And one of those kings, way down the line, was King Omri. And he was not a good dude. The Bible says in 1 Kings 16, 25, but Omri did evil in the eyes of the Lord and sinned more than all those before him. That's a lot of sin. Like That does not sound like a good dude. And then about five verses later, he has a son. And let's read about how cool his son is. 1 Kings 16, 30, Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. Like, that's a lot. That's, that's a bummer. It's not a good track record there for Ahab. And he's going to be the king, King Ahab, that we'll be going over tonight. So I have a little chart uh, to help if that was at all confusing. Uh, yes, graphic design or whatever you'd want to call this. So that's kind of the lineage right there of uh, just the king. So you got King David and his son, King Solomon, and then a lot of other just different kings. And then you got King Ahab all the way at the bottom. And that's, and that's about 100 years after King David. And that's where our story is for where Elijah comes in. All right, and another uh, unfortunate thing to mention here is that Ahab, just already being the guy he is, not too great, he marries a girl named Jezebel. She is also not too great. If you guys don't know the story about Jezebel, basically she comes from a foreign country with a foreign god, an idol that uh, they worship, and the god's name is Baal. It's a god of uh, fertility for like crops and people and the earth, and just this idol that they worship. And so uh, he marries her, maybe he wants to impress her, whatever it is, but just instantly starts worshiping Baal as the king of God's chosen people. He just pushes God to the side, instantly worships Jezebel's 
uh, idol, Baal, and leads all of the people astray. They build a, a shrine at the temple, and they just worship Baal. So it's not a good situation. And yes, yeah, so that's some backstory, and we're going to jump in to see who Elijah really was with 1 Kings 17.1. Now, Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. So I love this. Like, it gives us a little bit more than just, oh, yeah, Elijah does this thing. It says Elijah the Tishbite. It tells us where he's from, who he is. And actually, in Hebrew, Elijah means the Lord is my God. Isn't that cool to have a name like that? The Lord is my God. He was confident of that. And the Tishbite, what that means is one who brings to repentance. One who brings to repentance. So you put that together, and we can see that Elijah is going to be used by God to bring sinners to repentance. So already in the first verse, we see a foreshadowing of what's to come with Elijah's life. And then we see in the rest of that verse that he's going to... Um, that he told the king, King Ahab at the time, that there's not going to be rain on the land. And I don't know if you guys have been in this situation before where you've, uh, God told you to go tell the king of your land that there's going to be no rain, but I could imagine that it's not going to be too great. Like, that's how they live with their crops and things like that, so that's not good. But we do see that Elijah does that and that he's faithful already to do something that he knows is going to be hard. And because of that, uh, we see later on that the king King Ahab does not fancy him at all. He thinks Elijah is to blame from that, regardless of the fact that Elijah is a prophet from God and was told by God to tell him that. The king thinks that Elijah is to blame and does not like Elijah at all. So God is good. As soon as he tells King Ahab that, God brings him to a safe place for a few years out in hiding. And we'll jump one chapter ahead to 1 Kings 18, which is what we'll be looking at tonight. And let's read the first verse together. After a long time, in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. So a few years, that was three years that he was out hiding. And God tells him to go back to the same king that he made really angry three years ago and to tell him this. And so Elijah was faithful, and so he went to search for Ahab. And he comes across the palace administrator at the time, Obadiah, and tells him to go get the king. And so Obadiah goes and gets King Ahab, and that's where our story really begins for the night. So let's read 1 Kings 18, 16 through 19, and this is exactly when he uh, connects with King Ahab. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, is that you, you troubler of Israel? I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now summon all people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Elijah stands firm in his faith. He's confident. He challenges the king. He tells him that he is the troubler. He challenges him and tells him to bring all the prophets together on Mount Carmel for a big display of what we see, what God will do in the future. So I didn't include this uh, in 1 Kings 17, the chapter before this, but after verse 1, we see a little story of what Elijah does when he's in hiding, and he actually isn't recruiting another 850 prophets. Like, it's not going to be a fair fight of one Elijah talking to the king, telling him to get all of the prophets. Like, he didn't have a bunch of guys he was recruiting. He was hanging out by a brook for a long time, having birds feed him. So already we see that he is at a big disadvantage. So when they all gather together, all the prophets get together the next time when the king uh, announces for everyone in Israel and all the prophets to get together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah says this to him. Verse 21, Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. How long will you waver between two opinions? I love that. The ESV version says, how long will you go about limping between two different opinions? If we are indecisive, guys, between two opinions, we will not, we cannot give 100% to either one. We will try to give 100% to either, to both of them, and we will fall short. We're limping around trying to get the best out of life, but we really cannot do that. We fall short in both directions. And guys, I'm not just talking about, like, in this situation with the idol, with the god Baal. Like, I don't think you guys maybe have, maybe you do, but like a shrine in your dorm or a wooden idol, like, that's probably not what you guys are 
like thinking of right now. But what I am talking about is your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your sport that you spend so much time doing that you value over everything else or your GPA that you choose to not read your Bible or not pursue your relationship with God because that is your priority. That is the idol that I'm talking about tonight. And I want to have you guys like think about that. Like be careful that those idols, we might not think about idols. We might just think, yeah, this is a good thing that I'm doing. Like sports are good, so I'm going to do this. But that's exactly how they start. We really don't think about it. We don't actively choose to make it number one. But the small decisions add up over time. And before we know it, God is no longer God in our lives. I love this quote by John Piper. He's speaking on this verse, and he says this, the world may call it a dance. God calls it a limp. Do not be deceived by the world, guys. I beg of you, do not be deceived because being indecisive with your faith won't lead to joy or peace or happiness or anything that you think it will. If you're on the fence now, I encourage you to give your life wholeheartedly to following God. Make whatever change you need to, to not let an idol be a priority of your life. And this is what uh, brings me to my first point of the night, which is that God desires decisiveness. God desires decisiveness. I urge you to not limp around maybe going to church or opening your Bible or coming to a Tuesday night challenge if you happen to feel like it or if the star is aligned and you don't have homework. I encourage you to be decisive. Make a commitment to what matters eternally, to what will make a difference in your life and in the lives of others. Let's learn from the Israelites in this story and stop being indecisive with our faith. So let's get back to our story. Elijah is telling the prophets to have a contest in the next passage we're going to look at. And this contest that he talks about, he's, he goes to all the prophets, all 850 of them, and he says, how about this? And he's speaking to all the people at this point. And he says, how about you guys build your altar to Baal, build it, uh, have a bowl, cut it up into pieces, and sacri- like a burnt offering, like a sacrifice. But the big thing here is that you should not burn it. Do not make a burnt sacrifice. Just leave the bowl as it is. And I will do the same thing. Elijah says, he will do the same thing and build his own altar to God and have a bowl there. And whichever God answers by sending fire down, that is the real God. And the people hear this and they say, yeah, that makes sense. You know, there's probably only one God. So whichever one it is, we'll find out. And so they agree. And we're going to look at what they say. Let's look at verse 26. So, talking about the prophets. So they took the bowl given them and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they had made. This was hours of no response, guys. If we read this chapter, we find that they're there from morning until afternoon, just spending hours running around, dancing, limping. They actually are cutting themselves, as was their custom, to try to get their God to respond. And we see very clearly that their God, Baal, did not respond. There was nothing. So this happens all the way until evening time, from morning until evening. And finally in evening, The people there, all the Israelites that are watching this happen, the little showdown between all the prophets dancing around, making fools of themselves, they start to lose interest. They're no longer paying attention. And in evening time, Elijah comes and he says, hey, okay, everyone, I'm going to build my altar. And he brings people around and he rebuilds the altar that uh, was an altar for God, for the Lord, before it was torn down. And so he calls everyone over, he rebuilds the altar, and he does even more. Let's read verses 32 through 35. With the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it, large enough to hold two seahs of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bowl into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, fill four large jugs with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it a third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. So let's pause, right? Not only is it Elijah against 850 prophets, like already at a disadvantage, then he tells people to dump water on an offering that he's hoping people, that he's hoping God will light on fire. Like, I don't know if you've ever done this with an offering with a bowl and everything, but I would imagine that if you were to write up a plan, you would not want to pour water on it, right? That's putting himself at an even greater disadvantage. And the people are confused, but they do that. And they fill up the trench around it even, just full of water. It's against all odds, but this is exactly what God wanted. 
exactly how he wanted it to be. When God's power would be revealed later on, it would now bring more glory to God because of what God was able to do. It's an even greater display of power when an offering like that, full of water, just soaked, turns and is lit on fire. God loves to be at a disadvantage right before he wins. If you think back to last, last week's message when we learned about Daniel, how Daniel was thrown into a lion's den and there was just no hope, right? It just doesn't make sense to people. And God knew that he was going to win and Daniel came out unscathed. When you even look at Jesus on the cross, the disciples, the disciples and the followers at that time could not see what was going to happen. They could not understand and things looked bleak, but God knew what would happen. God knew that he would win. An obstacle or a difficulty or a disadvantage in your life right now is an opportunity for God to display his power in your life. I love this verse. It's Paul, Apostle Paul in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. It's just been on my mind a lot lately, and so I wanted to share it tonight. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. God's grace is sufficient for you, wherever you're at in life, whatever you're going through, his grace is sufficient. Our weaknesses allow Christ's power to rest on us. Like that is amazing, guys. That is such a great truth. God can use you no matter how broken you feel you might be, no matter what you're going through, God can use you. I wanna encourage you not to hide those weaknesses from God, and, but really give them to God and ask him to use your life. And that might be just spending a lot of time in prayer or asking someone, maybe a leader in challenge or someone meeting with you to, to help you understand why you're going through things or to ask for help. And they might be able to help you see clearly how you can use that weakness for God's glory and how you can grow through that. And this brings me to my second point of the night, which is that God desires his glory. God desires his glory. When we humble ourselves, guys, and we give God room to work, he can bring himself more glory. Allow God to work in your life. Allow him to do that. If you're holding on to something, give it to God. I, I just want to ask you guys to really make an application if you need to. If something that's on your mind right now, something that you're thinking about that you haven't given to God yet, allow him to glorify himself through your life as you continue to walk with him. If God can do amazing things, with a soaked animal offering, like we're about to see, imagine what he can do in your life with what you're going through and who you are. So we're gonna move on to the next part of the text of our story. And I think this is really the focal point of the entire story. Let's read verses 36 and 37. At the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed. Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me. So these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Elijah doesn't limp around like the other prophets. He doesn't dance. He doesn't cut himself. He doesn't do any of that. Elijah prays. Elijah prays. He prays consistently. He prays confidently. He prays this prayer in front of everyone standing before him. And he doesn't pray to a religion or an idea or a, a thought. He prays to a, a loving and personal and powerful God. And his prayer is not for his glory. It's not a, for a firework show or even for him to win. His prayer is so that those people would know that the Lord is God and that the Lord is turning hearts back to him. There is no one like God. He is alive and active, and he hates sin and destroys idols. And that same God that was there that Elijah prayed to is here in this room tonight that we have access to pray to. We can pray to this same personal and powerful and loving God. There is no one like him. This was Elijah's prayer to the Israelites. And guys, this is my prayer for you all, that you would know that the Lord is God. And the second part of that, that the Lord is God, and secondly, that we would know that the Lord is the one who turns our hearts back. God is sovereign over all, and that includes us. That includes our hearts. Our hearts turn. We can choose to turn to God, and we can turn from sin, and we can turn to follow Christ, but ultimately it's God who turns our hearts. It is not ourselves. And this leads me to my third point, 
which is that God desires a personal relationship. God desires a personal relationship. He wants to know you. He wants you to know him, to know his love, his peace. It's the same God now as it was in the story we're reading. He is alive and active, and we might forsake him. We might leave him like the king Ahab did and all the Israelites. We might do that. We might forsake God, but he will never forsake you. He will never turn from you. No matter where you're at in life, no matter what you've done, no matter who you are, he will never leave and forsake you. And we can have a relationship with God just like Elijah did. Like, isn't that amazing? Sometimes we read these stories in the Bible of these people and we think, wow, that was, you know, they're, they're not God, of course, but, you know, we're over here. And that's like the prophet Elijah. Like, no, we are people too. We'll see later on your handout. There's a verse, James 5, 17, that Elijah was a human being just like we are. And we can have a relationship with God just like Elijah did. And what better time to do that than right now if you haven't yet. So as soon as Elijah finishes praying, we see what God does with this altar. Let's look at verses 38 through 40 together. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also looked up all the water in the trenches. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Then Elijah commanded them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let anyone get away. They seized them, and Elijah had them brought down to the Kishon Valley and slaughtered there. That is a wild couple of verses. The sacrifice, like I'm just going to acknowledge it, the sacrifice and the wood, just gone. Like it didn't get a little crispy, it was gone. Like the stones in the soil, gone. The water in the trench all around it, gone. Isn't that crazy? The prophets, gone. All right. But, so <laughs> when the fire came down, the people cried out in that moment, that the Lord is God. I love that. Even in that moment, like Elijah had just prayed, the Lord is turning their hearts back to him. I can only imagine what it would have been like to be there at that amazing display of power that God had when he sent the fire down and those people were just worshiping God in that moment. It's just amazing. So after this happens, Elijah goes to King Ahab and we're gonna read the last big section of the night. Verses 41 through 46. And Elijah said to Ahab, go, eat and drink, for there is the sound of heavy rain. Remember what God said at the very beginning, that when at verse 1 of 18, that he was going to send Elijah to go to the king to tell him about rain. This is it right here. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, bent down to the ground, and put his face between his knees. Go and look toward the sea, he told his servant, and he went up and looked. There was nothing there, he said. Seven times, Elijah said, go back. The seventh time the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds. The wind rose, a heavy rain started falling and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came on Elijah and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. So he tells the king that there will be rain. And then what does Elijah do? He prays. And he prays persistently that whole time. The servant came back seven times, and he was praying throughout that. That is a persistent prayer life that I want to have. I don't know about you guys, but just reading this is inspiring. And I can't imagine that being a short time, too, of the servant running back and forth, and he climbs to the top of the mountain to pray. Like, that is amazing. And he didn't, just like he told the king, you know, go eat and drink like this is over. He didn't go, you know, lie down on the couch and watch some Netflix after like not even just a busy day, but there's like prophets against him and everyone's worshiping a God that he is directly opposing Baal. And like that must have been a lot of stress. And he doesn't take some time off after that amazing display of God's power. He gives thanks to God in that moment. He goes and prays. He doesn't go lie down on the couch and rest, but his priority is God. He immediately goes up and prays persistently. Elijah prays incredible prayers, and God rewarded his faithfulness. Uh, I mentioned this verse earlier. Uh, I didn't mean to. It just came out so good. In the New Testament, in James, it says this, and I hope this uh, gives context to you too. If you have heard um, James 5, 5, 16 is a great verse, but it's followed by two amazing verses about Elijah and about his prayer life, and I love just reading these verses together. It reads this, therefore confess your sins to each other, 
and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Like what an amazing example that we get to see Elijah's prayer life and how powerful and effective our prayer can be if we are righteous, if we are living right in the eyes of the Lord. It can be powerful and effective prayer. I want that. I don't know about you guys, but I want that prayer life. Elijah was committed to God and to doing what was right in God's eyes. And it was clear to all the Israelites around him at that time. And this brings me to my last point of the night, which is that God desires commitment. God desires commitment. So I wanted to touch on the last verse of that passage we just read. I love this verse. He says this in uh, verse 46. The power of the Lord came on Elijah, and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. Right? He ran ahead of Ahab to Jezreel. The king that left on a chariot before Elijah had come down the hill, after spending all that time in prayer, the power of the Lord came on to him to run that fast and that far. I looked it up after because I was really curious. And from Mount Carmel to Jezreel, it's about 20 to 35 miles away. So like that's some power of the Lord right there. Like, <laughs> I need that for running one, but that's incredible that he can run that fast. Like the power of the Lord came on him. It wasn't Elijah. It wasn't his build or his training. It was the power of the Lord. And when you are committed to God, when you're committed to living rightly, you run. You don't walk. You don't limp. You run, guys. You run. I want to ask you, where have you been limping in your life right now? Where do you need to straighten that out to get right with God, to live right before God? And where do you need to run in your walk of faith? God wants you to commit your life to him. Or if you have to take the next step of faith, he wants what's best for you. I want to urge you to make that commitment, whatever it is, whatever God is putting on your heart right now, to write that down on your Connect card later, to write it down on your phone in a journal and make a commitment. Like pray over that and ask God, bring it to God and ask him what he wants. And he will reveal to you the just amount of love that he has for you and the fact that he wants what's best for you. Make a decision to commit to what not just matters right now, but what matters eternally, guys, what matters for your life. So the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal, I just, I love it. And it's so relevant, guys. It's so relevant right now. Baalism, the religion is, it's a contemporary religion. It's a prosperity religion, a God that brings fertility to people and the land. Like that's easy to get behind. It's a broad-minded religion of the time to, for everyone to have an open mind and be able to fall for like that God of just something that's so accessible and easy for everyone to like. Like it sounds easy. It's prosperity. Who doesn't want that? And if we take this type of religion and apply it to our life right now in 2022, guys, it's not some far out thing. There are so many things just like Baalism in today's societies. If we are to take that and apply it to today's society, I want to encourage you to not have faith in something like this, to not have faith in an idol. I wanted to end our time tonight by going over Romans 12, 1 through 2. Let's read this together. This is Paul speaking. He says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Live every day for God. Worship him through the offering of yourself daily and allow God to turn your heart back to him. Wherever you are in your faith, whatever you are going through, turn back to him. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. God, for just examples in the Bible of men, just righteous men like Elijah that we have access to. God, that you have given us our um, just ability to, to read your word. God, that we have access to it that we can learn from it and know you more. And God, that we can see through stories like this, your love, God, and your desire for us to know you, to have a personal relationship with you. And God, I pray that um, all of us in this room tonight, that we would take away something from this story. God, that we would know that 
there are next steps in our lives that you want us to take, God. And I pray that you would help us to just spend time um, as we start the next song, just in reflection, God, just that you would reveal to us what our next step is. And God, that we would give that to you. We thank you for this time and we praise you, God, a loving and personal and powerful God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.